Well, good morning. Let me uh, add my welcome uh, to you. I'm Matt. I'm the minister here. And uh, it's great to be gathered here this morning. We are um, primarily just picking up Jesus' teaching here about the heart. Because that's the context of what we're looking at. And I just want to pause for a moment and ask you, how is your heart going? Have you had any, uh, maybe, experience recently that may, may, may have been a little pain point, perhaps, for you? Um, I needed to clarify something with um, Medicare. So you have to call their number. And uh, it's, actually, it's actually the Department of Human Services, which is the most inhuman title that you've ever heard in your life. And... Uh, it was a, a mistake. One of our doctors, they had um, uh, one of our kids was a patient, and they kind of put for Medicare reasons that he had somehow paid for it as well. So I needed to rectify this. Not my mistake. So I called them up, and uh, 26 minutes on hold is how it went. And I thought, no worries, I'll be able to work through and explain exactly what's going on here. This should be fine. And then. Um, if you've ever been on one of those phone calls, they tell you that you need to be respectful. They'll be respectful to you. They also tell you about 30 times that you need to have your Medicare number in front of you. But when I finally got to a live person, she said, oh, what, what date did that happen? So I went through my paperwork trying to find it. And she said, did, did you actually take him to the appointment? Oh, no, it was my wife. And she said, well, you probably need to get your wife to call. And I said, well, she's at work. Uh, I've got everything here now. I can find, I can give you the date, everything that you need. And she said, look, sir, you need to get your wife to call me. Uh, this, it, it, you don't have the information in front of you. And I said, oh, I've, I've got it. I've, I've got it. It's, it. It doesn't make sense. It's the same Medicare account. It's just going to go straight into the same bank account. It's all fine. What you're saying doesn't make any sense. And she said, I'm going to have to exit this phone call. And I wasn't mad during the phone call, but I was afterwards. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, well, what, what is happening? Why, why am I feeling this? What's going on? Well, I've obviously got very important things to do. I've set aside a little time to go through some of this admin. It's been sitting here, this letter, for a long time. I needed to follow it up. Uh, somehow, I thought I was nice and calm, but I've come across very somehow disrespectful enough that she could hang the, the phone up and uh, feel a bit like a criminal. Uh, and plus, I have to call back sometime in the night time to fix this up again. And then it just got me thinking, well, what about her experience? Obviously, they put that warning in there for a reason. She must get shouted at for an eight-hour shift. It must be a horrible job. You have to have some kind of way out, some exit strategy. But it was a little moment, and I try and pay attention to it when my heart just gets, starts to justify things. When there's a little pain point in my heart, and I think, what, am, what do I really think about myself? How do I really view myself, and how little... Do I view the other person in this interaction? So I want us to be thinking about that. We're going to see this picture of Jesus Christ, and he's going to show us a picture of God. We want to get a correct, a right picture of God, but also at the same time, to see a picture of ourselves. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's, this is a teaching moment. In fact, that's what it says there in verse 1. That was his custom. Crowds of people would come. And he would, just as a regular rhythm, teach people. He would be teaching them about the kingdom of God, about what it was like. And what happens in verse 2, something that we've seen before, some Pharisees, religious leaders, they come with the intent to test him. And they ask this question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now this is... Uh, a juicy kind of topic here in the ancient world. They want to trap him. It's kind of they want to, they want to test his defenses. He's a new preacher. He has something to say. But what Jesus does is fascinating. He continues his teaching by asking a question about their question. And it's very helpful. He does it continually, but it's something that is uh, really, really insightful. On Fridays, I teach SRE at Balmain, Wednesdays at Nico, 
And um, we were looking at heroes of faith, looking at Stephen the martyr. And the way that the lesson works is you just go in and you, you give the class a scenario. I've got year three to six. And the scenario was simply this. You're with a friend, you go into a shop, and uh, your friend steals something, puts it in their pocket, and goes to walk out. But w- what do you do? It's a scenario about standing up for, for what's right. And I asked that question. It sat there for a little while. And then the kid said, is it a good friend? Are there security cameras? He said, is it, a, like a, is it just like a, a little shop? Or is it like a big company like Woolies? Is stealing always wrong, they said. There was 10, 11, 12 fantastic questions that they asked back to my question. And it was great to explore that. Really helpful. We are really engaged and invested in trying to work out this thorny little issue. Jesus does the same thing. He knows the hearts of the Pharisees. He knows why they are there. And here is this question. So what he does is he takes this opportunity, questions, answers it with a question, and he teaches people about their hard hearts. That's his aim. So they ask this, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? It's a juicy question. It's happening in the people of God, but the law, of, uh, the law exists at, in the Old Testament which says it's a terrible thing. God, in fact, hates divorce. So people know that, but they know also that it happens and divorce occurs. It's such a juicy, thorny question. It's like we would have at a family barbecue, someone drops a question about public education or private education, about having kids or via IVF. It's one of those polarizing questions here. But for the people of God, here it is. You're either on one side or the other. We are going to We're going to gain some information about you, Jesus, they think. We're going to find out what you're really like. We're going to trap you. But when he asked that question, they are then forced to answer in verse 4. They say, well, Moses permitted a man. Sorry, in verse 3, he asked, what did Moses command you? Verse 4, he permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It's not God's good plan. But what Moses did, he allowed, it's a concession. It's it's permission. And it's meant to be a little bit difficult. It involves a writing of a certificate. It's meant to be, you can't just verbally say, we're now divorced and send away. And the wife has to go back to her family or she's now in a vulnerable, impoverished situation. It is a law though. It's a law. It's come from Moses. And it seems to be an attempt, maybe, to make a best of a bad situation. You're going to have to slow down. You're going to have to work on this certificate. You're going to have to perhaps work on things. And it's only a permission. It's not a command. It's a law that is a permission. It's almost a retrieval ethic. Make the best out of a difficult and tough situation. Except that Jesus goes further And says it's not as simple as that. Verse 5. The reason it was because of your hearts. Because they were so hard that Moses wrote you this law. Not only that. It actually had become justifiable. There's now a method. There's now a way to divorce. You simply write the certificate and send on the way. The hearts are hard. There needed to be a a way to divorce. Moses allowed it as a permission, but in fact, our hearts are so hard that it was abused as well in that time. And what Jesus is not doing here is giving a, a lecture on marriage and divorce. He's not giving a legal lecture here. He's responding to their trap and he's teaching them. First the crowd, but also the disciples. I want you just to recognize how hard the hearts are. These are the people of God. How hard our hearts are. And it's not even so much about this one issue, but this is a keyhole into recognizing why the Messiah had to come. Jesus then begins to teach about the heart of marriage. 
So just right there in verse 7, he begins to talk about this is God's good plan. You see, his God's good design is that a man will leave one household, that of his father and mother, and create another household, be united to his wife is the word. In verse 8, the two will become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Here's, this, here's the plan. A new household is created, and one plus one equals one. Man and the wife, they're married together, and it's so close, it's like they're united together. They are one flesh. They share a house, they share a bed, last name, bank account. This is the plan. It's a promise. Marriage is a covenant. It's till death do us part. It creates a kind of a psychological safety so that when things are difficult, when things are hard, when there is a grind in life, you've made the promise till death do us part. Here is the picture. Work it out. Work through it because you know what the end looks like. You are united together now and you will be until it is death that breaks you up. He even then goes into a description of a, of a warning. Verse 10. This is not public to the crowd. The Pharisees aren't there. But in 10, he says, uh, when they were in the private, in the house again, it's just the disciples. And they ask Jesus about this. He answers in verse 11, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman, a woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. This is God's grand plan. This is his good design. And to take what Moses has gotten you as a mechanism to get out of one relationship in order to begin another one is disobedient. It is sinful. It's, it's adultery. And we've been thinking a little bit, um, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the idea of being salt. And there's this high view of marriage in the ancient world, or in terms of God's perspective, high view of marriage in the Christian world. And if salt is about combating decay and just, just holding things together, one of the meanings of salt, then we know that a good marriage with a low divorce rate in society is good for society. This is not just from a Christian perspective. This is, let's do some studies. Let's get some information. It's good for children to be part of a stable, married household. And so there's a call for us to have that high view of marriage as we see God's good design, his original plan. But I just want to take this for a moment and say that marriage, though, is only a symbol of a greater marriage. What Jesus will go on to teach his disciples about is how he is the groom. And the ultimate marriage is how he lays down his life to be united with his church. And more than one flesh, it's actually a tighter relationship that Christians are united to Christ. So united, in fact, that by faith, when Jesus died for sin, it was like we died as well and it covered us. When he was resurrected, we too were resurrected in freedom, forgiveness, clean from sin. Where on the cross, what Jesus did was to create the church, the church which is called the bride of Christ. He is the groom. So we want to think for a little moment as we just examine our hearts. God knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows you. He knows me. And in spite of that, Jesus died for us. He went to the cross for us and it was sufficient for us. For all of the things we've ever done or disobeyed or thought or planned or acted on in defiance of God's law, God's rules. And we're united to Christ by faith. That's how we partake it. 
by just faith in him, by trusting in him. And yet that's not a simple thing. Faith is not a simple thing. I put the word out last week that we're just looking to gather a few people together for Christianity Explored course. I love running these little courses um, where we can talk about anything to do, God, Jesus, Bible, but actually any questions that people have. Please do come and, and let me know if you're interested. Just a uh, great opportunity over a couple of weeks to talk about those deeper things. And I remember being um, in one of the courses, that we, we'd come to the end, we'd meeting together for about five weeks. And one of the guys had said, this has been so good. It's answered all my questions, but I just don't know if I'm ready to make that step, to put my faith in Jesus. And uh, a guy next to me, he said, yeah, faith is a slippery thing. It's, it's a difficult thing. But you know what? When I got married, he said, I had to put my faith in something. He said, you know, when I got married, it was like um, I didn't know everything about my wife. I didn't know how things would change in the future. How we'd be very different in our 40s to how we were in our 20s. But we made a commitment and for life. That was an act of faith. And my friend shared, well, that's the same with my trust in Jesus Christ. It's an act that faith is, you know, do you know enough about Jesus? Do you know enough about his goodness? Do you know enough about his sacrificial love? Do you know enough about his resurrection power? Do you know enough to just place your faith in him and then work it out? Jesus never promises good times. As a, as a Christian, he doesn't say all your problems will be sorted out, life will be easy. He says, he says there'll be an abundant life, but in that abundance will be an abundance of suffering as well. It will come. It will happen. And in fact, you might be persecuted because of me. But also you'll be blessed. The life that is abundant, it is true. It is true. We uh, joined this church at the beginning of the year and we just got 50 new friends, you know. <laughs> More than friends, brothers and sisters. We, we, we've, that's an abundance that's occurred with the bride of Christ. That's what connects us together, what unifies us as a church. We're the bride of Christ. But actually, we're all just a bunch of sinners who have been saved by Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. We were enemies of God. And Jesus went to the cross that we are united with him that our sins can be forgiven. We're not enemies, we're friends of God. In fact, we are children of God. And he went freely. He, he, he went and his sacrifice, his loving sacrifice, the groom laying down his life for his bride to make her perfect and spotless, is not something that we can earn. And it's not something that we can ever pay back. It was a free gift. And all we can do is respond by faith. What Jesus is doing here is teaching about himself. They don't know it yet, but he's going to go and he's going to die for his followers here, but actually for us as well. And Moses was an interesting character because he, he's like a mediator. You know, he had the Ten Commandments and he brought them to people of God. And the people of God were like, okay, we know how to obey and follow God. And, and, and yet they would then have their hearts hardened. They would turn away from God. They would look to other gods. Described as a kind of adultery and unfaithfulness. And Moses would say, God is not happy with this. And then they would turn to Moses and say, please go and speak to God and have us forgiven. And we need to change. And there would be that cycle and cycle that would continue as a mediator. But it was a cycle. We see it all through the Old Testament. Moses was God's chosen one here as a mediator. But he always had a plan that he would again send his chosen one who was his only son. And so when Jesus comes, he comes once for all. His death is sufficient for the forgiveness of our sins and the transformation of our hearts. It's freely given. It's an act of grace. How do we put our faith in him? What does it look like? What, what, what is faith? Well, right after this event that occurs, th there's this 
interaction between the little children and Jesus. And what's happening is that the parents in the crowd, they're bringing, bringing the little children and, and Jesus is speaking with them and blessing them. And the disciples are a bit mad because, you know, they're trying to, again, curate who can have access to Jesus. And it says that they're mad and they say, stop bothering the teacher. Stop bringing your kids here. They rebuke the parents. But what does Jesus do? He's just as mad. He says, no, 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 do not stop that. Do not stop them bringing the little children to me. And he holds them. And in verse 15, he teaches this. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the little children in his arms and he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. An incredible, compassionate picture that we have here, but he's, he's teaching what faith is like. Just come to me open-handedly like a child. You don't have to bring anything. You're not proving anything. You're not earning anything. You're just receiving like a child would with an open heart. And a soft heart. We trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in him. That's how you receive the kingdom. This abundant life now and this eternal life that is to come. What stops our hearts from being soft? We, lo we lose that childlikeness, I think. We, we lose that right picture of ourselves. Just sinners in need of a beautiful saviour. And then it starts to result in certain things, lack of love or pride or sometimes greed. We're holding on to the things we've got to hold on to. We can't open our hands. We can't let them go. I want to make one little side point. I'm most interested in talking about our hard hearts, but I do want to say that when we've thought about marriage and divorce in the church before, we have got it wrong. And it seems that we've um, taught or implied that if you're in a marriage that um, where there is abuse that God wants you to stay and that's not true you, you can't take these words as yes he has an ideal plan but if there is a, abuse that's going on it's right and good to, to es escape to leave and you must and even if the person in that relationship is using words of the Bible He's using them incorrectly. In fact, I do want to say this. That, um, we have a standing relationship with the people that we know. Um, but we've, Amy and I have said, if you need to get out, we will care for you. We've seen certain things and we've asked questions and we've prayed a lot and attempted to help as much as we can. And that, that might be something that you need to do. Just uh, as a Christian person who is salt in the community, who has faith, not fear because of our faith, and it might be something you need to perhaps offer. We will look after you and your kids if you need to escape. We want to give you the, the, the truth of what's said here. Abuse means that that marriage is over. Don't let the person spiritualize it. Let me make another point. Another point about our soft hearts. Jesus, he knows what we're like. He knows what we attempt to justify. And yet he gave us his spirit. He gave us our, his Holy Spirit, which will continue to renew us and, and chip away at our hard hearts. I was reading an article over the weekend uh, and the, the woman was writing about how lonely it is to live in Sydney uh, how difficult it is particularly in her experience to be an expat and in the end she's just her friendship group of other people from the UK and, and, and South Africa and she said it's a funny situation where people they have their friends in Sydney from school university it's kind of enough and <laughs> they close down they've got enough friends of people who are like them who are similar with shared experience. And friends are good like that, those long-term friends, they're good. But it was an interesting assessment to say, hey, in Sydney, different to other 
big capital cities around the world, she was saying, where she'd live. And we know there's loneliness. We know there's a couple of years of lockdown. We've sort of got into this habits of being antisocial. Even though there's a deep desire and a hunger to be deeply connected with other people and things are mostly open, there's this disconnect. Let me encourage you to think about your heart. What's it like meeting someone who's new or different or strange? What's it like chatting to a stranger? This is something that, um, it was an interesting point just in that article. That was her natural inclination. Walking along, waiting in a queue, being in a park. It was just a chat to a stranger, but often that would get shut down. And I thought, I think I'm in that habit. I'm dropping kids off or I put my earbuds in. I'm totally peopled out. I just want to go for a walk or a run. And I thought, I need, what if I actually thought, what's it like to talk to a stranger? Because it's part of God's command to, to love your neighbor as yourself. What if we prayed as a whole church just to see that God would soften our hearts and like children we would just receive his kingdom and then live it out. Live out what the love of Christ looks like to, by talking with a stranger, taking a risk, meeting someone new, welcoming them. Let me pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I just pray for this part of your word. We're just working through it. And all of it has relevance to us. Some of this might be deeply wounding and triggering for our own experiences. And we just ask for your peace and your wisdom and your spirit and your people. Perhaps we can be um, loving and careful. Or perhaps Father will say the wrong thing and we ask for quick forgiveness from the other person. Dear Lord, we pray for our hearts generally that we'd rightly see who we are and who you are. Father, give us soft hearts that love people the way that you love them and uh, care deeply for people who are in need and who you have brought into our life. Father, may we be salt and light in this local community in the inner west. Father, may we be known for people who have kindness and compassion and love because our hearts are soft. Because, Father, we know you've demonstrated your love to us, your covenant to us. And we know what happens at the end of this life and we know what happens afterwards. Take away our fear. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.